the end of life space. Some of the other presentations I give focus on like what is hospice care, what is palliative care, that type of thing. So the objectives of the presentation tonight, kind of what I hope we're going to get through uh, discussing, is really to describe a little bit more about what caregivers today are up against and some of the stressors that they might face. Um, also going to identify some of the supportive services that might be available uh, following a diagnosis uh, that could aid you know, the patient, the person going through it, or their caregiver. And then finally, we're gonna explore some techniques for self-care and wellness, um, one of which is called the Community Resiliency Model, or CRIM. Um, we are gonna touch on that one, but I just wanna let you know that if you find um, that interesting, I also give workshops uh, that go into more detail about that model. Um, also, I just kind of want to set the stage, if you're not familiar with my job title, which is Community Health Worker. Uh, we go by many names. Sometimes we're called lay health workers, health coach, peer counselor, outreach worker. Um, but basically what sets us apart from other people is that we seek to serve the communities that we come from. Um, and we seek to be more of like a normal person. So part of my job is when I'm talking about these topics to try and not use like medical jargon that you need a PhD to understand, right? I wanna talk to you just like I talk to my neighbor across the street or my friend in the grocery store. Um, so we come from the communities that we seek to serve um, and we're really focused on eliminating barriers to care and making sure that the education we provide is not only easy to understand, but it's respectful of your experiences, your culture, your religion, your feelings. The other thing that I do a little of is what we call resource navigation. Um, and we're gonna touch on this towards the end. I have my business cards there. Um, if you ever have a need, if you are looking for caregiver resources, if you are looking for a support group, or even if you're looking for something totally unrelated, like maybe you need to find a food pantry or something like that, you can email me and I will do my best to connect you um, with the resources that I know about in the area. So getting into caregiving, I really love this quote uh, from the former first lady. Um, and as you know, they know President Carter, former President Carter right now is in hospice care. Um, but this is from his wife and she says, there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who need caregivers. It really is a universal experience um, that touches us all in one way or another. Um, and so because of that, I think it's really important that we prioritize um, the well-being of caregivers. So that's from Rosalind Carter. Okay, so let's dig into what I mean when I talk about caregiving. I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people who are caregiving and don't call themselves caregivers. This was me when I was taking care of my dad. I never referred to myself as, oh, I'm a caregiver. I just thought, I'm being a good daughter. I'm taking care of my father. But I never really identified with that label. Um, sometimes people think of caregiving as just that, like, oh, I'm taking care of my, my elder parent. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. Parenting is caregiving, right? Um, checking on a neighbor. If you know a neighbor is like by themselves and you bring them dinner sometimes, that's a form of caregiving. You are providing care to someone else. So it really means tending to the needs or the concerns of a person who needs your assistance. Um, that could be due to their age, whether they're young, like a child or elder, could be due to an illness, an injury, or a disability. Also important to note that caregiving is a family or communal role for some of us, but there's also paid caregivers, right? People who do this for a living. Um, and also, you know, providing care for someone else can be both rewarding and exhausting. As I kind of mentioned in the beginning, many people find themselves thrown into this. And it's a lot of pressure, especially if you are caregiving full time and you don't have maybe someone supporting you in the way that you wish you did. 
another thing, a uh, misconception I would say, is sometimes people think, oh, it's only caregiving if it's like um, complex medical stuff. Like if I'm you know, changing an IV or if I'm doing certain duties. But we're gonna talk uh, a little bit later about all the things that can be caregiving. So just a couple of numbers for you, just so you get a sense of, if you are caregiving, that you are not alone. This is a widespread issue that's only going to increase. Um, about 21% of our population provided unpaid care to an adult or a child in 2020. More and more Americans are caring for more than one person at a time, so being a caregiver for multiple people. Also, a majority of caregivers, an increasing number, are reporting that their own health, the caregiver's health, is only fair or poor. Um, also important, I think we can look around this room and know that majority of caregivers are women. 61% of women versus 39% of men. Also, about 60% of caregivers are working in a job. So when you think about that, it's essentially like having at least two full-time jobs if you're working outside of the house and caregiving. Um, so these numbers come from the National Alliance for Caregiving and they're a great resource as well. I also want to note that there are um, certain populations, well there are many people of all populations, but especially among certain populations like Hispanics and African Americans, we see more and more of what we call sandwich caregivers which is when someone is raising a child and caring for an aging uh, parent. So, you know, having both of those roles. So I just want to take a moment um, to just kind of acknowledge that, as I said, many people do not realize how much caregiving will change their lives. Something happens, they step up, and then before they know it, they are in it, right? And there is no end date. You don't know how long you are going to be doing it. Um, so I just want to pause. Uh, you are not required to share, but if anyone is a caregiver and would like to share um, their story, how it happened, how it's affected you, now is the time. Again, you don't have to. Yes? I'll share for my mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> so my dad had a massive stroke 10 years ago. Oh, no. And um, so my mom was working at the time. He was retired. Um, but then she ended up having to retire as well. And so she's been primary caregiver for 10 years. 10 years, yeah. wow. And, so, and it's, you know, of course, progressively, as he's aged and she's aged, it becomes more difficult. She's doing a great job, of course. <laughs> but um, it's, you know, as he's grown older, he's like 80. 80, 80 84 now, so not only the stroke, but of course age as well has progressed, and so it becomes more difficult. So, absolutely, that's a lot to take on. I'm sorry to hear yeah. um, that your father had that stroke. It's okay, you know, but he lost the ability to speak, so it, that also makes the communication much more difficult because he's frustrated and can't tell us why he's frustrated, or he's upset, or he doesn't feel good, and you know, it's not only taking care of someone, but it's true, but not being able to communicate with them. And yeah, that's a lot. Of what is, you know, going on with them. That's a lot. It's hard enough to do what someone needs when they can say to you, this is what I need. It's even harder to just kind of hope that you're, yeah. you're you know, to try and decipher what's going on. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, I guess I'm my mom's caregiver. Um, she's 92 completely with it, but I was thrown into it. Um, I had moved back from Michigan where I was living with my husband because my sister wouldn't step up. And so I'm disabled. I have my own health problems and I'm dealing with my mom's health problems and now she has kidney disease and you know, she's slowly, it's slow. So it's lot. gotten better. I, her kidney function has gotten better, but she still has kidney disease. And how long has that responsibility been on you? Oh boy, 11 years. Wow. And I've been doing it myself. And I have my two sons 
who help around the house, but my oldest son is autistic. He's high functioning, but still on the spectrum. So I gotta watch out for my kids. I gotta watch out for my mom. We have a dog. I gotta take care of the dog, and I come last. And that's, I think that's the way it is when you're a caregiver. You put yourself last. Absolutely. That is something um, that I hear all the time. Um, and I will just share, you know, from my own story. When my father was sick, he had COPD and congestive heart failure, and he had a very slow decline. Mm -hmm. um, he was on in-home hospice care for almost two years, which is a really long time to be on hospice, but that was just like they kept thinking, this is the end, and he kept kind of hanging in. My mother quit her job to be his full-time caregiver, and I was kind of like her assistant, her backup. Um, and I will say that I watched my mother during that time, it was probably about four years in total before he passed away in 2021. My mother was superwoman at that time. Uh, her knees came last. And I will tell you, um, you know, not only is that not good for you, when my dad did pass away, it was like she finally um, knew that wasn't on her and she started having all sorts of problems, right? From like a buildup of not taking care of her own health. So it is, it is really hard um, as a caregiver. There are only 24 hours in a day, right? Each of us can only do so much and you feel like something's gotta give and many people, you know, are quick to to sacrifice their self as that something. Well, I looked at my mom because she took care of my dad who had leukemia and he was at in home hospice as well. And she did, I don't know how she did it, she did a stubborn woman. <laughs> but Sometimes stubbornness can be a, a blessing. Very strong. Yes. I mean, um, <coughs> well, and it's like, well, she took care of my dad. My sister won't step up. So I got to do it. Yeah. I, I have no choice. I have to do it. She's my mom. We don't get along. We have fights. We argue. But she's still my mom and I love her. Right. And I do anything for her. And she knows that. Well, thank you for sharing that. Did anyone else? Yes. My husband had a, five years ago, he had a heart attack. And progressively, he's getting worse and worse. And the doctor says, his heart is not going to get better. It just won't get worse. But in the meantime, I'm the one where I have to always push him for everything to do something because the doctor says he has got to do something, otherwise he's going to go. Right. Because you, your body has to be in the motion. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just what it is. In the meantime, I am 24 hours with him all the time, and it's the only time that I can go line dancing and three times a week. So I have to get somebody to stay with him. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can really just stress the day for the three times a week, you know, what I'm going. But it, it's just, it seems to me like I'm, he's getting mean. Mm -hmm. He's getting older. He, he's 87 now. But he's getting mean. He's constantly yelling at me. And then, so I says to him, gee, I'm doing everything for you, and that's how you think? Me. Yeah. It, it's stress. It's a really a very big, that's what I says. Oh my God, if I have a heart attack, just take me home. <laughs> <laughs> but then we've got none on the, on the family. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I just want to highlight something that you said. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about later in the presentation, everyone's situation is different. We don't have the same, we don't all have the same access to finances, supportive network of people. Um, what have you, but I really love that you said three times a week you get away from line dancing because it's so important to make time, whether it's three times a week or it's five, ten minutes um, at the end of the day when you are solely focused on something that brings you joy or that nourishes you. And it's so hard, um, but it's so important because it's a very stressful situation and that, that getting mean uh, is something I've seen a lot of too, right? When people are having health problems, when they're not able to do the same things that they used to be able to do, um, they get angry about it. 
and they take it out on the wrong person, which is the person that's there with them 24-7 trying to help. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yes? Um, my dad got really sick. I think pretty much the same thing with COPD and emphysema. And then the heart failure. But he, it was a good at least five years, maybe six years. He just got worse and worse and worse. But he's a very private guy. You know, he doesn't talk about his feelings or anything. So I was had to like really pay attention to him to see how much he was suffering so I knew what to do. Um, and then we got to the point where um, he was in hospice. I, he was home, I took care of everything, I gave him the morphine, I got up every two hours to make sure he was still breathing. If he needed something in the middle of the night, I got up and gave him something. So that went on until he passed away. But now, my mom, her um, her thinking, she's, she's in dementia, for sure. And it it's mind-boggling to me, the, the things that she comes up with that she thinks are okay, or she makes really poor choices. Mm -hmm. So I do everything I possibly can to make her life easier for her. And she does everything she can to make her life harder, which is hard on me. It's like I'm beating my head against the wall. It's like being in a battle. <laughs> yeah. And I don't I don't really have time for myself because I, I don't really trust her mm -hmm. to be home. Um, you know, I don't want her to leave the, the stove up. Right. Yeah. I don't want her to she goes outside a lot, especially sometimes, every time. Um, it's the stupidest thing, but she likes to pull weeds. And she's very unsteady, and she refuses to take her walker into the yard like she's supposed to. So she falls all the time. And one time she was out there for a good half hour, couldn't get up. So, yeah, it's, I have it. I'm sorry to hear that, I and mean, I thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your father and that um, you find yourself in this, you know, cascading caregiving of one and now the other. Um, that's very, that's very, very tough. Um, thank you all so much for sharing uh, your stories um, because it's important. Um, I, I like to know kind of who my audience is, but also it's, it's important to have outlets sometimes and, and, you know, be amongst people who might be going through similar stories so you know that you are not, um, you're not the only person who might be experiencing some of these issues with caregiving. And then bipolar on top of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. so you've got to take care of your own health as yeah. well. It's I'm with my mom 24-7. I never get a break. I mean, this is the first break I've had in quite a few years. It's like, even just being out for an hour, I can't do it. I can't get up. It's got me there. Well, I'm glad that you came tonight. And I think um, each of us, you know, has a unique experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. But sometimes, you know, when people think about taking time for themselves, they think about it maybe in just one way, or the way they used to take time for themselves before they were caregiving. Um, so I would encourage you to think about um, what is out of the question and what might be possible. Um, but of course, you know, you, you know your life circumstances better than I. I will say, though, that the people that I've known that have been in, in a caregiving experience and have been able to find even small outlets, small moments of quiet, small moments of me time, um, it benefits them as the caregiver, but also benefits the person they're taking care of. Um, you all just shared quite a bit about you know what you what your story is and what you do. Um, 
So again, every experience is unique, but caregiving includes a lot of stuff. It can include medical needs. You know, you referenced giving injections of morphine, um, daily living tasks, things like changing diapers, helping someone get dressed, um, companionship, talking to someone, being there for them uh, when they need your support. Also, sometimes uh, people don't think of these two as caregiving, but transportation, helping people get to doctor's appointments, and even financial support or, you know, handling someone's finances, paying their bills every month, that is a caregiving task as well. So I think just, you know, in this discussion and hearing your experiences, you can probably identify with many of these emotions. As I said, some people may, may have experiences that are both blue and green, positive and negative emotions. Some people might fall more all into the not so great emotions or the great ones. Um, but when people care give, they often report feeling angry, feeling frustrated, feeling guilty, like no matter what they do, it's never enough. Um, we're guilty for wanting to have that me time. There's also grief that people experience. Um, grieving, anticipatory grief, like when this person passes away and they're already grieving for them. Also grieving the life you used to have before you were a caregiver um, and feeling isolated and burnt out. Some people do experience, um, you know, at the same time, positive um, emotions, feeling like you have a duty to this person and you're stepping up and fulfilling it. Um, sometimes people get closer through the experience of caregiving and there may be days where you feel closer and days when you feel more angry um, or vice versa. And a lot of people um, express a sense of fulfillment um, and empathy uh, that they get from their caregiver experience. Now I want to talk a little bit about stress. Uh, caregivers are very stressed um, and we tend to always think of stress as a negative. There is a spectrum of stress. Stress can be positive, neutral, it can be very, very toxic. Um, but stress just means our body's response to a change or a challenge. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes if you have a very small stressor that's like, oh, uh, I'm in college and this assignment is due tomorrow and that makes you do the assignment, that's a good thing. Um, also, in emergency situations, uh, stress is a good thing. Um, our bodies are designed to respond um, and take action. So stress is natural. Uh, but when a person has chronic or toxic stress, um, it means that their body is always in a state of high alert. Not only does that not feel good emotionally, it's actually very damaging for your physical health. So this is kind of that spectrum I'm talking about. So when a stressor is temporary, when it's mild, when it resolves itself, that is positive stress. Um, when a stressor is a little bit more prolonged but still goes away, the person is still able to return to a state of balance, that is tolerable. Toxic stress, which is what we are really worried about, is ongoing and relentless uh, stressors. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, more about this, but essentially when you encounter a challenge or stressor in your environment, things start happening inside, including stress hormones being released. So if you could imagine right here in this presentation, if all of a sudden the door were to open and in walks a tiger, we would all have a stress response, right? There would be a signal from our brain to the rest of our body, oh my gosh, there's a tiger, what are we gonna do? We gonna run, we gonna hide, how are we going to survive this? So this is what you hear about stress and trauma. If you've ever heard that someone is stuck in survival mode, that means that they are always on that edge. They are always getting a signal that they are in danger and their body is always secreting those stress hormones. Those stress hormones are okay momentarily, like an instance where you are actually in danger, but when they are constantly, constantly um, being released, they damage your blood vessels, your arteries, they can cause heart disease, it can cause um, stomach problems, sexual dysfunction, all sorts of problems to your physical health, in addition to really, really not feeling good. 
Um, so I often describe, describe toxic stress as too much happening too fast, too little for too long in terms of you know, what we've been talking about today, not having time to recover, not having time to nourish yourself, and too much for too long. So too much too fast might be an example of you're taking care of someone um, and they fall and you are not sure that you are able on your own to get them up, right? That's a lot on you and it's happening really fast. Too much for too long, some of you have expressed really long caregiving journeys over 10 years. Um, that is a long time um, to be responsible for someone else's needs. So as I said, toxic stress can, learn, can lead to um, physical things like high blood pressure, anxiety, chronic headaches, lowered immunity, where you feel like you're catching every cold under the sun. Um, but it can also uh, lead to behaviors. So what we call being emotionally reactive, where maybe someone just says one little neutral thing to you and you fly off the handle. Why? Because you are in that mode um, that, that your nervous system is activated. Um, so a lot of this really, really results in people not being able to show up as their best selves, right? Not being able to um, have the joy and the relationships and the life that they want um, because they are so stressed. So what can we do about it as caregivers who are under so much stress? A few things that I recommend is to first explore all resources and supports that might be available to help you with your caregiving workload. The less overwhelmed you are, the less stress there is to manage. Now many people will think, okay, you're talking about a paid caregiver, I don't have money for that. Paid caregiver is one option. I'm gonna wade into the um, area of family. All families have their drama. I have been in that situation where I am the sibling who steps up and the other sibling does not want to do a damn thing. Um, every family has their stuff. Um, but what often happens in families where there is more than one person um, is that one person kind of falls into that role and they take it all on um, and the other people aren't doing much. I, I don't know the dynamics of your family, but if you have siblings, cousins, aunts, even non-blood relatives, friends, neighbors. If you have other people in your life um, who can help in some way, I encourage you to have the conversation with them. Um, I had a sister who made it very clear that she was not interested in doing any caregiving tasks. For a while, I was very kind of bitter about that. And then for a few months uh, later, I was still upset and bitter, but I went back to her and I said, okay, you are not helping with the caregiving, and you make more money than me. Can you contribute some money uh, to the household? She wasn't happy about it, but she did. Um, and I, I still wasn't happy that, I was, that it was just money and not care. But have those conversations. You know, turn to people in your life and say, I'm struggling. And if there's something you could do, I would appreciate it. Many people are not going to step up in a 24-hour caregiving role or even a 10-hour caregiving role, but they might be able to come over one evening and sit with the person that you care give for so that you can go out and have a little time. One evening every couple of months is not much to ask about. Ask from someone who, who cares for you. So I encourage people to have those conversations. I also encourage people to explore things like home health, palliative care, hospice care when appropriate, um, and really anything that can aid you in terms of your responsibilities. So that's one. Two is regardless of the support that you have, think about what you can do to prior prioritize your own uh, well-being. This little image there says you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, that idea that if you don't pour into yourself, you won't be able to care for others. But the other piece of that is, even if you can, even if you are somehow pouring from an empty cup, your cup deserves to be full. You deserve to be well, just as much as the person that you're caring for deserves to be well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about self-care tools 
I also really love support groups. There are a lot of support groups for caregivers in person and online. So even if you're someone that can't get out of the house, maybe if you can um, log on you know, from your living room, sometimes it's really great to be able to tell your story. Other times people go and they don't say a word, but it's just so beneficial to hear other people um, kind of touching on similar things. I'm also going to be talking about the community resiliency model, which is something that anyone of any age can do. It's some very simple skills. If you've ever done any mindfulness practices, it has pieces of mindfulness, but it's really based on the science of how our bodies respond to stress and what we can do about it. So again, like I said, sharing the workload. If you have people in your life that you can reach out to, even if they're not able to contribute money, they're not able to care give, can they do something for you? Can they go pick up your groceries for you? Um, can they cook you a meal one night? We often think of um, how much we have on us and how much we would like significant help, um, but sometimes people are able to do small things. Sometimes caregivers also get the idea that they are the only one who can do it. Maybe they actually have people that might be willing to help, um, but the caregiver is like, you don't know how to do the meds, I do this every day, it's gonna take you way longer. I had that with my mom. She was my dad's full-time caregiver and she knew exactly what she was doing. I lived there, I helped, but I wasn't in it the way she was in it. Sometimes I would say, Mom, will you please do this? You wanted to go to church. Please go to church. I'm here. I will take care of it. And she didn't want to take, you know, the 15 minutes to show me the medicine and what I needed to do. I respect that. But when you take that time at the beginning, then that, if you teach that person, then they know. And then they are able to help. And that, once she finally did that, then I was able to step up more in my dad's care. Um, in terms of the medical care that I referenced, um, home health care is something that is sometimes covered by insurance and Medicare, um, depending on the diagnosis. It's basically just a range of services that come to your home. So sometimes it might be a certified nursing assistant coming once a week. Um, sometimes it's therapy. Also rehab, um, you know, sometimes when people have strokes, they qualify to be in a rehab facility for a limited amount of time um, and then come home. There is outpatient rehab as well that can sometimes help people. Also for those who are struggling uh, with dementia, memory care um, is something that has become a lot more common um, and it's a special, you know, programs and activities that are designed to help people with dementia not progress further. There are actually, <coughs> excuse me, actually some community-based nonprofit groups that also do trainings specifically for family members who are caregiving um, to give you some skills to better deal with someone who's who's struggling with dementia. Um, as I said too, I do presentations that really focus on what palliative care and hospice care are. Hospice care is end of life. It is for people who are dying. Um, and it involves a whole team of people coming to the home and providing care. It is not 24-7. You as a caregiver will still be, be handling a lot of that, but it provides an extra layer of support. Palliative care is something um, that people can get before they are dying, but it is for people with serious diseases such as cancer. And it's, it's similar to hospice in that it's comfort care. It's designed to help people with their symptoms. Now in terms of resources, um, for you or the person that you're taking care of. As I said, I did leave my business card. Um, so we at the Hat Foundation use something called NowPow. It's like an online portal that lets us find resources and connect you. If you're someone who also likes to do your own research, if you go on a computer and you Google either social care network or findhelp.org, um, it pulls up a tool where you can like put in your zip code and it has financial help, medical help, um, just really anything you can think of uh, to find resources. Um, I also wanted to mention the Illinois Area Agencies on Aging. 
These aging agencies also um, deal with disabilities. So they often have services for people who are elders, but also people with disabilities. Um, so you can go to, I will also share these slides with everyone who registered, so you have the links. You can go to Illinois Aging and find out um, who your area agency is. In Chicago, city of Chicago, it's the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services. In sub suburban Cook County, it's an organization called Age Options. So that is the, if you live in suburban Cook County, that is your area agency on aging. Age options. I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit more about um, what these agencies provide. Let me go back one second. Um, so they uh, can do assessments of your needs, not only your needs in terms of resources that you might need, but also your emotional needs. Um, so they have rolled out this tool, excuse me, long name, Tailored Caregiver Assessment and Referral, or T-Care for short. So this is an individualized uh, tool where you are going to be asked questions about your specific situation. And the questions are designed to identify uh, your stress level and what stressors you are facing. Is it emotional and physical stress only? Is it financial stress? Um, and it's really designed to help them understand what you need to be better equipped as a caregiver. The reason they have this program, um, I would love it if they had it just because they cared so much about caregivers. They do care. Um, but what they have found is that when caregivers are overburdened, people end up in nursing homes. And that's very expensive. Um, so this tool is designed to let's, instead of putting people in nursing homes and paying so much money, let's see what we can do to support uh, caregivers and keep these people in their home. Um, so as I said, I'll share these slides. Um, but you can take the assessment online. You can also do it over the phone. Um, and once you do it, um, they will analyze your results and then someone will reach out to you with an uh, individualized care and referral plan. I reference support groups. This is something that you can find at that um, findhelp.org. You can search for support groups. But also, please feel free to email me. Send me an email, say, I came to your presentation, this is where I live. I want to do an in-person or I want to do a virtual and I can provide you with a lot of different options. In terms of self-care, um, people sometimes get the wrong ideas about self-care. They sometimes think that self-care is, you know, going to a spa and getting a massage or taking a bubble bath with a face mask. It can be, that can be, you know, self-care. But self-care is really taking the time to think about your own needs, um, physical, spiritual, emotional, and then taking small steps to meet them. Many people uh, who are caregiving feel like, this is ridiculous, I don't have time for self-care. I like to remind people that self-care is not a luxury and it is not selfish. It is something that in the long run benefits your health and will benefit the people that you're seeking to take care of. So there are a lot of tools online that you can find for self-care, but some things that some people do, examples of self-care, uh, if you are religious, praying can be self-care. Um, being outside, whether that's taking a walk, whether that is sitting on the porch, whether that is opening the window and letting the breeze uh, feel you, or even if you don't get out much, surrounding yourself with plants. They've done studies that nature really does reduce stress levels. Laughter reduces stress levels. If you can laugh with a friend, laugh at yourself, laugh at something online, on TV, um, it actually does the body good. When you are thinking about what a self-care ritual or routine for yourself might look like, I encourage you to be realistic, right? For most of us in the room, it is not realistic to say, I'm gonna have a day for self-care, or I'm gonna have the whole afternoon for self-care. For most of us, that's just not possible. 
So think about what might be possible. What could you try? Could you try a half an hour of self-care? Could you try 10 minutes of self-care? Um, another thing that people do for self-care, meditation, journaling, affirmations. Affirmations is basically the idea that I'm going to speak it into existence. Um, so an example of an affirmation would be writing, my health matters on a post-it note and sticking it on your refrigerator. And every time you open the refrigerator, you see that your health matters. Um, you are worthy. Even if you are skeptical and feeling like you can't uh, build in even the smallest amount of self-care, I remind you that sleep is also self-care. So if you're someone who's sleeping six hours a night and you feel like you might could squeeze in an extra half hour, I encourage you to do that. Another form of self-care is strong social relationships and also venting, right? It feels good to tell people what you're going through. Um, and even if they can't fix it, they can just receive it. They can hold space for it. Some people do that with a friend, some people on the telephone or in person. Some people do it in online groups. There are a lot of groups on Facebook uh, for caregivers. Um, some people do it with a therapist. Some people do it in a support group. Excuse me. So all of these are examples of self-care. I will say that for me, um, it's not always this. I do affirmations. I like to spend time in nature. Um, but sometimes self-care for me is watching uh, my favorite TV show instead of going to sleep when I should have. You know, allowing myself that small pleasure. Um, so I encourage you to think about what you might be able to do, big or small, to nourish yourself. And then try to do it. Um, are we scheduled until 8 or 8.30? 8 8.15. 8 8.15. Okay, I just wanted to get a sense. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the Community Resiliency Model, also known as CRIM. Um, this is a model that I do full workshops on um, that are about an hour of just the model. But I did just want to touch on it because I think it's something simple um, to start with that you don't need a lot of time to do. This model is basically a model that's really based on science and it's based on our physical reactions to stress. So what I mean by that is instead of thinking, oh, I'm upset, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, we don't focus on the emotions. We focus on the physical. So we focus on how are my muscles feeling? Um, how is my breath? Is my heart rate uh, accelerated? Am I sweating? How's my temperature? So physical sensations is what the model focuses on. And it's a set of simple skills that you can use when your physical sensations tell you that you might be stressed. So it helps, these skills can help you to return to a state of balance. So what's cool about this model is a lot of people deal with stress and trauma, um, and it feels like it's out of their control, right? We can't control the fact that something bad happened to us. We can't control the fact that we're in this caregiver role. Um, but this model allows us to take a little control over our own nervous system. So that nervous system that I was talking about that's secreting stress hormones, there's things we can do to stop that. Um, so this is a model that is trauma-informed and also resiliency-informed. If you've ever heard of trauma-informed, that just means that we need to understand that people's behavior and reactions um, is impacted by what they've been through, what's happened to them. Resiliency informed means that we, we consider that, we consider what's happened to people, what they've been through, their lived experiences, but we also ask what else is true, what is good and right and strong about that person. Um, and it really focuses on the idea of resiliency. So I'm going to share an app and a website that tells you more about this model. Uh, but one of the core concepts of the model is we all have something called a resilient zone or an okay zone. So when we're in this zone, as you can see by that yellow flowing line, doesn't mean that our lives are perfect, right? It doesn't mean that we're living in a mansion, lounging, living it up. No, our lives have ups and downs. But what it means to be in this zone is we're able to cope with those ups and downs and still be our best selves. Um, we are able to manage stressors. 
Of course, things happen in life that serve to bob us out of that zone. And that is what this um, nice little graphic is showing you. Um, so sometimes that might be something significant, like you know having to rush a loved one to the hospital that's going to stress you, that's going to bump you out of your zone. Sometimes it's very small things like being in a traffic jam or forgetting where you put something. Um, the idea of this model is that when we're bumped out of our zone, um, we are going to see changes in our physical sensations, those things I mentioned like heart rate, body temperature, and that's also gonna be accompanied by feelings and emotions. So when we talked before about being emotionally reactive, sometimes when someone freaks out on you about the littlest thing, it's not because they're mad at you, it's because they've been bumped out of their zone. They're not able to appropriately cope with whatever's going on. It can also look the opposite, so it doesn't always have to be aggression. It can be feelings of numbness, lack of motivation, exhaustion. So the idea of this model is one, get to have an idea of when you are in your okay zone and when you may have been bumped out. That's number one, just to have that awareness. Because even if you're not able to return to your okay zone right away, you're able to say to someone, you know what, this is not the best time for me to be having that conversation with you. I need a moment. So number one is awareness. But number two is the science shows us that through the practice of these skills, you can actually widen your zone. And so what that means is no longer do the small things uh, bump you out because you're able to cope appropriately with them. So this slide is just meant uh, to demonstrate that we are up against a lot in our lives. We have talked primarily tonight about caregiving, about medical um, struggles, mental health struggles, uh, but there's a lot going on in the world. Hello, COVID, that was a lot on people. Um, people are dealing with systemic issues, things like war, things like domestic violence, racism. Um, chronic illnesses, addictions, burnouts. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that we're up against uh, in life. So I say this just to say that if you do use this model and you do find yourself being bumped out of your zone, uh, there's no shame in that, right? It's not an easy life that we're up against. The idea of this model is not to say, oh, you just need to be more resilient. You just need to toughen up. Resiliency is not survival. It doesn't mean like, okay, just keep hitting me with things and I'm gonna emerge um, bruised and battered. Resiliency means thriving um, and healing despite whatever is going on around you. So this idea that our adversity is not our destiny. Another big part of this model, what we pay attention to grows. So what do I mean by that? The analogy that I'll give is if I'm gardening and I'm trying to grow flowers, and I'm getting some flowers and I'm getting some weeds, and I'm becoming very hyper-focused on the weeds. Got to get rid of them. They're ruining my garden. Um, so all I do is buy uh, pesticides and, and pull those weeds like, like your uh, mother likes to do. Um, I'm really focused on that negative. But if I can focus on the abundance of the flowers in the garden, even if the weeds remain, if I give those flowers what they need, soil, sunlight, water, they are going to grow and they are going to expand. Even if the weeds remain, the beauty of the flowers um, will be far more powerful. The same thing is actually true in our brains and our nervous system. There have done studies that show um, the more you use connections in your brain that are healing, positive, resilient, the more those connections grow. Uh, we often think about this in terms of children, right? When children are young, we're always told to talk to them, right? Have that running conversation because they hear the words, that's how they build those brain cells to talk. People are actually surprised um, that we retain a lot of control over our brains into adulthood. So what I mean by that, our brains are amazing. They have the lifelong, not just in childhood, lifelong capacity to change in response to our learning and our experiences. That is what is called neuroplasticity, a very hard to say word. 
This other big word at the bottom, neurogenesis, is the ability of our brain to create new neurons and connections between neurons. So what I mean by that is if you build a self-care ritual, if you start investing a little in something that makes you happy and that is uh, relaxing and de-stressful, every time you use that, you do that activity, those neural pathways are strengthened. Um, so another analogy, if I am in a jungle and I live on one side of the jungle and my good friend lives on the other side of the jungle, the first time I go to see her, it's going to be hard work. I'm going to have to be chopping down trees, clearing a path out of nothing. But every time I go to see her after that, it's going to be easier because that path is already cleared. Every time I walk that path, it's going to become more permanent in the ground. This is the same type of thing in our brain. The more you use a neural pathway, the stronger and more permanent it becomes. So I know that's kind of a lot of science, but I like, I like to set the stage so people know that this is just not like um, an idea of like, oh, let's do this. It's really based on science. So this model has six skills, and tonight I'm only going to touch on two of them. But as I said, there's a website and an app that you can follow up with that has them all. You see in the center is tracking. That is the foundational skill. We're going to talk about tracking and then resourcing tonight. Um, so what I mean when I say tracking. Tracking really just means noticing. It's noticing and paying attention to our internal sensations. So what is going on in our minds and bodies in a present moment? Now you can track your emotions. You can say, I'm feeling angry right now, but you also really want to try and focus on tracking sensations. So that's what these colored boxes are, is sensation words. So thinking about physical pain and pleasure, thinking about heart rate. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it jittery? Breathing, is it rapid, deep, shallow light? Temperature, are you cold? Are you hot? Are you warm? Muscle tension, are your muscles tight? Are they loose, rigid, or calm? So when we track, we pay attention to what's going on internally with our bodies. So just like this dog is sniffing out the trail, when we track, we also want to determine if that sensation is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So I will tell you for myself, when I feel overwhelmed and stressed, the first sensation that I notice is my body temperature. I feel hot and sweaty in a way that is unpleasant for me. Um, so you want to identify that sensation. You want to name it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And then the other skills of the model are designed to help you when you're having those sensations. So basically, that sensation is your kind of clue that maybe you've been bumped out of your zone. Maybe you are experiencing a stressful situation. And it sounds kind of silly to people. They're like, I know when I'm stressed. I don't need to pay attention to my breathing. Like, I know I'm pissed off. I'm stressed. Many of us have gotten in the practice of separating what's going on in our heads and our hearts from the rest of our body. We've kind of been trained ourselves not to pay attention to our physical sensations. So it can take some practice. Um, the other thing that I advise, we have a negativity bias. It is easier to track unpleasant sensations than pleasant ones. But I encourage you to practice tracking when you are doing something you enjoy, when you are having a good day. Pra take a moment and pay attention to what that feels like. The reason why is what I just said, that whole concept of what we pay attention to grows we have to understand what pleasant sensations feel like if we are going to grow them within ourselves. The second skill uh, that I'm going to talk about is a resource. And resources uh, in this context is just something that brings you joy. So a resource could be a person, could be a place, a thing, a memory, a part of yourself. It doesn't even have to be real. Um, so, so just like this cartoon character girl who's imagining herself uh, on a tropical island, 
I had a friend like this who never traveled, never went on a cruise. But one of her resources was her fantasy of going on a cruise. When she was stressed out, she would imagine herself on that cruise ship, and she would swear that she could even feel, feel the breeze on her skin. That's how strong the fantasy was. So it doesn't have to be real, as long as it brings you pleasure and joy. Um, some other examples on the screen, listening to music. That's a huge one for me. Even when I'm working, 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 I can put on a song in the background, and all of a sudden, things are a little bit easier. Being in nature, being with friends or family. Um, even if you have family that maybe has passed away or that's far away, sometimes looking at a picture of family, that power of nostalgia, um, is enough to bring us joy. So the idea behind resources is even people who are in really tough situations, almost everybody has at least one resource, something they can think of that makes them happy, makes them smile, brings them joy. So we encourage you to think about what resources you have in your life, maybe even make a list. And the idea behind a list is it really helps with intention. It sounds very simple, right? Of course, if I'm stressed, something that brings me joy might calm me down. That's a pretty simple concept. But in those moments when we're overwhelmed and stressed, um, sometimes it can be hard. So sometimes it really requires that intentionality of saying, I'm gonna make this list of resources and I'm gonna put it somewhere where I can see it and the next time I feel like I've been bumped out of my zone, I'm going to access a resource. That is what we call it. So that was just a brief little taste of that model. Tracking is what you have to do to kind of understand where you are in your zone and what's going on with your physical sensations. And a resource is one, one tool that you can use if you're experiencing unpleasant sensations, you've been bumped out of your zone, you can use access a resource. So this model that I've introduced tonight, um, I'm a certified trainer of this model, but the model is actually created by a group called Trauma Resource Institute. Um, and they also made an app. So the app is something you can get on your cell phone in the app store, it's free. It's called iChill App. It's available in English, Spanish, and Ukrainian. Um, and it's cool because it gives you an overview of that graphic of the resilient zone. It has brief overview of each skill. One of the skills that I didn't talk about tonight is called grounding. It's very similar to meditation. So there's a, a narrative grounding exercise on the app that you can try out and see if you like it. If you are not an app person, but you do have access to a computer, you can also go to iChillApp.com, and that's the website with all the same information. So, my wish or my hope for you uh, after this presentation, what I would recommend um, is to go home and if you're intrigued by this model or intrigued by, not even this model, but thinking about what you might be able to do in terms of self-care, um, the first thing I uh, would recommend is thinking about what is self-care for you? What is something that would nourish you? What would that look like? Um, the other thing that I always recommend to people, and it sounds a little silly, but it goes back to that idea of affirmations, and also that idea of caregivers putting themselves last. I encourage you to go home and write yourself a love letter. So actually on paper or on a computer, write a letter to you that is 100% positive. It doesn't focus on regrets or what's going wrong. It focuses on what is positive and unique about you. So in mine, I might say, Maureen, you are really strong, and you can always laugh at yourself uh, when something goes wrong. You have that humor. Write a letter to yourself that talks about what is good, unique, special about you, the things you're doing right, how amazing it is that you've been caring for this person selflessly for all these years, um, write that love letter to yourself, and then I encourage you to read it out loud to yourself. And as you read it to yourself, pay attention, track, see what that feels like inside, what that does to your physical sensations. Um, so that's, that's the homework assignment. If you should choose to do it, it's definitely an invitation, not a requirement. 
wanted to end um, on this note. We started by talking about how everyone's caregiving experience is unique and it's not always a positive one. Many times it is one that is filled with anger and guilt. If that is your experience, that is okay and that is valid. I did want to share um, some positive experiences of caregiving that people have shared with me. Some people are blessed to feel these positives while they're caregiving, and for other people, it's not until after that caregiving experience has ended that they look back on it. But the idea that you have an opportunity to grow closer to someone you love, the idea that you might have great moments with someone along the way, the idea that you are able to show your love and your sense of duty to that person, the fact that you are being a blessing to someone else, and sometimes people even experience personal spiritual growth and fulfillment. So those can be some positives that you might experience if you are caregiving, but whether you're having a positive, a negative, or a mixed experience, I remind you that you matter in this experience. We put so much emphasis on the person that we are caring for that I really encourage you as hard as it is to not forget about yourself along the way. Because your health matters. Your mental and emotional wellness matters. Your happiness matters. Um, so thank you again for coming. I left a handout up front that lists um, some of the other topics and workshops I offer. If you would ever like me to come and give them um, at a community group, a faith community, I'll pretty much come anywhere and talk about these topics. Um, this is my contact information. It's also on the business cards. And then finally, I ask you if you would be kind enough to complete the survey. There are paper surveys there. They're anonymous. You don't have to put your name. You can also access the survey by pointing the camera on your cell phone at the QR code that's on the screen. And so I'll leave that up just so people can access it, but I also want to open it up if anyone had uh, questions, uh, comments, or insights. Do you know if there's any, I know you said to email you, but offhand, do you know if there's any support groups in this area close by? Like yeah, you know, I'm not, I would have to look to see about denials, but I've definitely seen some, um, I want to say in Arlington Heights and Morton Grove, um, or maybe it, maybe it's displaying. So not, not too far. Um, I do a lot of like health fairs and senior fairs, and I feel like every time I go to one, I learn about a new place. Um, so definitely shoot me an email, um, and then you know, just just remind me that you're in Niles, and I'll send you a whole list. Okay, perfect. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Have a good rest of your night. I'm use that model. Even if she doesn't. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> I, I use it myself. I think, you know, it really helps if you um, have someone else. I do it with my, my teenage daughter, and it, yeah. it helps keep you accountable. You know, have someone to say, I think you've been booked out of your door. Maybe you need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, it can be helpful. It's, it seems very helpful. Yeah. I depends on her, which isn't fair, but that's what happens. But that's life, you know. Thanks. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Sure. Yeah, we have a volunteering page on our website. Um, the lady at the desk. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Should be at the bottom of every. Yes, I forgot to order a whole volunteer page. There's an application to fill out, and then um, 
any opportunities? I'm just, I'm just thinking like, you know, if it was sure. an hour or sure. or something like that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So we have a lot of I used to do the library, but it was high school. Okay. Of course you go. Thank you. Take care.